All right, Crystal, what's on your radar? Well, we have been on top of covering Andrew Cuomo's COVID-era corruption, deadly decision-making, grift, and cover-up. We've been covering that from the beginning. And I think we've had pretty clear read on one big reason the media gave him a pass with fawning coverage, softball interviews, and, of course, Emmy Awards. He was a useful foil to Trump. MSNBC explicitly framed their coverage around the idea of two presidents, a terrible evil one in D.C., and a glowing savior in New York. They got one half of the equation correct, but were so invested in Cuomo, the glorious resistance hero, that they happily overlooked all of the emerging evidence and a long track record of being, well, extraordinarily Trumpian in his bullying, in his abuse of power, his lies, and his manipulation. CNN, of course, chose to allow his own brother to interview him, clowning around about his nose size while nursing home residents died. But there was another aspect of how Cuomo got a pass for years that I didn't actually fully put together until I read a great piece from Rebecca Traster over the weekend. In her article titled Abuse and Power, she asks how Cuomo was able to get away with his abhorrent and possibly illegal behavior for so long. As it turns out, a big part of the story is how Cuomo cynically weaponized gender and identity politics. He hired women that he was attracted to, and then he treated them like playthings. Then he would turn around and use the number of women on his staff to deflect any questions about whether he was actually committed to a single progressive value. He also created his own women's group to further shield himself from criticism and to kneecap the very women who were trying to defeat him in office. Other women's groups turned a blind eye for fear of rocking the Democratic establishment boat. For her article, Traster spoke with 30 different women who had worked with Cuomo, and they described to her a workplace where women were hired for their looks, objectified on the job, harassed, and degraded routinely. As she put it, quote, Almost all who worked for him commented on the extreme pressure applied by both the governor and his top female aides to dress well and dress expensively. Some were told explicitly by senior staff that they had to wear heels whenever he was around. In addition, Cuomo was facing a wave of allegations, of course, from at least six women, which run the gamut from uncomfortable comments to outright assault. But now that Cuomo is under fire for his bad behavior... The same women who were hired for their hotness and expected to dress to please him were held up as proof that the allegations could not possibly be true. At a recent presser, he reminded everyone that, quote, we have more senior women in this administration than probably any administration in history. Ironically, given that Cuomo was made out to be the anti-Trump, it is actually an extraordinarily Trumpian move. Anyone remember at the RNC how aggressively they used women and people of color as tokens to make the case that Trump couldn't really be so bad? There was an entire montage with his female aides talking about how wonderful he is. There was Kaylee McEnany sharing an inspiring story of him offering the most basic courtesy of a call after she had a double mastectomy. Anytime politicians want to talk about how many of this or that type of person they employ, rather than what their actual policies are, you should be very, very suspicious. Cuomo, though, he went even further than Trump in cynically weaponizing feminist identity politics. If you follow New York politics, you know he has long been at war with the Working Families Party, or WFP. One of the tactics he used to try to destroy the WFP was to start his own minor party called the Women's Equality Party, or WEP. His bet was twofold. First, that progressive voters would get confused and vote on the WEP line rather than the WFP line. Minor parties need to achieve a certain number of votes to continue appearing on ballots, so that could have really hurt the Working Families Party. And second, he hoped to benefit from a sort of faux progressive sheen by receiving the endorsement of the Women's Equality Party in his primary races against Zephyr Teachout and then Cynthia Nixon. As Traster explained, quote, Though the WEP endorsed Cuomo over Teachout, a woman, and would in 2018 endorse him over Cynthia Nixon, also a woman, it branded itself as committed to women's equality by commandeering a pink-striped bus. Now, undoubtedly, some voters who wanted to be good liberal feminists were swayed by Cuomo winning the endorsement of a pinkwash party he himself created. But it wasn't just fake women's groups that helped to shield Cuomo and his network. As Ryan Grimm, Brianna Joy Gray, and Aida Chavez reported back in 2018, Emily's List, the 800-pound gorilla of women's political organizations, they left the women who challenged Cuomo's power network out in the cold. They didn't back Zephyr Teachout. They did not back Cynthia Nixon. But maybe even more significantly, they didn't back the female challengers to the Cuomo-aligned Democrats. Those Democrats had teamed up with Republicans to block any sort of progressive legislation. For the most part, Emily's List, they just looked the other way. 
failing to help the women candidates themselves and allowing a coalition to maintain power that regularly blocked progress on economic and social issues that would disproportionately help women. Cuomo clearly thought that by just saying the right progressive identity buzzwords, he could get away with practically anything. And the sad thing is, it was working. The media and voters, they were buying it hook, line, and sinker. If he had just stayed in the realm of corruption, killing grandma and covering it up, he would have been just fine. But when college-educated women started coming out with stories of harassment, the walls began closing in on him, and the pink wash was no longer enough. A lot of the same voters who may have been swayed by the Women's Equality Party were now forced to choose between their pandemic crush and their Me Too-aligned political identity. With Trump defeated, it was now safe to turn on Cuomo. And no number of female props and pink striped buses can save him now. Sagar, this is one aspect of it that I hadn't fully put together. I I forgot about the women's equality part. I knew about it at the time, Mm -hmm. but I kind of forgot about it. Rebecca Traster lays out that piece, and it's really incredible. Invented this whole fake pink wash party to endorse him, to give him the sheen of like, oh, of course I'm progressive. The only thing progressive about this guy was the sheer number of women who he would have on his staff. And why were they even there? They were there as like tokens and as eye candy, completely degraded and abused the whole time. It really is incredible, though, how well all of this worked. No, it is. And what actually bothers me more is about how open of a secret it was in the political press. So I read in Vanity Fair over the weekend a longtime New York like politician, political journalist who was like, yeah, we all knew. And he went, he literally wrote a unauthorized biography of Cuomo and then goes back to re-interview people and tells all of these stories that come out. And I'm like, wait, so you wrote a whole biography on this guy and you had all this reporting showing he was like an abuser and abusive and terrible. He had one thing where he's like, we either agree or we kill. Like, that's what we, I'm like, Dude, that like you're not in the House of Cards episode. Yeah. What is going on here? And it was a total it was like a, in the Weinstein thing. It's like everybody in New York City politics knew, the journalists knew, the people who even wrote biographies of him knew. Nobody really either brought attention to it or spelled out how terrible it was, and he was allowed, you know, in order to do this women's equality party nonsense and it was all out there for the taking and then finally the spark gets lit, but It's like, what took so long? It's like now he's no longer the useful thing against Trump. And it does just show the veneer and the sheen of like fake identity politics whenever it it comes to this. That's it. And I do think it exposes how susceptible the Democratic Party base has become. I mean, look, I blame the overwhelming majority of the blame here on the media. I agree. Who knew? Right. They knew the truth and they decided that he was useful for them in the moment. So they propped him up. The Mm -hmm. softball interviews, not one single hard, not one single hard question of this guy during the time when it actually could have mattered. But I do think it also shows that Democrats at this point, because they've been fed so much on just representation alone and how much that matters. And look, I don't want to say it doesn't matter. It does matter, but it's not the only thing. And if you have a politician who all they want to talk about is, I'm progressive because I hire women. Here's the number of women in my organization. Mm -hmm. Let me, as Trump did at the RNC, let me put together a montage of just women. Not talking about policy, not talking about what I'm doing, but just the sheer numbers. And then the Women's Equality Party and the pink stripe bus is like the perfect thing. You know what it reminded me of? Hmm. Remember when Elizabeth Warren was like... I was just about to Google the quote. (laughs) I was like, what is it? I can't get it. When she was like, I'm going to wear a pink hat for, uh, what was it? For I don't remember. It was like something. Planned Planned Parenthood. Parenthood. It was the Planned Parenthood. She's going to wear a pink hat on at the inauguration. inauguration. Yeah. And everyone's like, like, what wow. did she say? Or yeah. she did the same thing with putting the Black Lives Matter blocks oh, behind yeah, her. Matter. Where, like, this somehow substitute, this just total tokenizing, yeah. like, the most symbolic BS kind of faint towards any remotely progressive value substitutes for actual policy. And it's sad thing is that it really kind of works sometimes, especially when you have a media that's utterly complicit, that doesn't ask a single hard question, that they take in the line of just like, oh, well, he hires a lot of women, yep. so he must be fine for women, he must be progressive, he must be a good guy. When the reality of why those women were hired and the type of work experience that they had and how toxic and gross that environment was paints a wildly different story, but they weren't interested in telling that story until very, very recently. All right, Sagar, looking forward to your radar. That's next.